Welcome to part 11 of creating visual movie effects in Blender. In this tutorial, I'm going to be covering how to add CG 3D elements into real life handheld footage. This process is called camera tracking because when you add CG elements into a real life shot uh, with a camera footage and the camera is moving, you have to track the camera in order to keep the CG elements looking like they're staying in the right spot in your real life footage. Let's go ahead and check out the result of this tutorial. I'll go ahead and press play. And as you can see, I have a monkey head, a torso or donut, and a cone sitting on my kitchen counter. Um, and the camera is moving around, it's just shot handheld, and it looks like they are in the right place the entire time, like they're actually there, and with a nice shadow under or behind all of the objects. And it looks fairly realistic, at least for these very plain looking objects. Let's go ahead and take a look at one more example. I'll drag that into my player now and make this bigger. Uh, this is another piece of handheld footage just a few blocks from where I live. Uh, of course, I've added in a cube and two monkey heads sitting in the middle of the street. There are shadows beneath all three objects and they kind of look like they are in the scene. There is some adjusting done after we've tracked the camera and we've added the objects in to uh, the colors of the entire scene as well as the objects to make them a bit more blue like the scene. But let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, I'll go ahead and open up Blender and click on the splash screen to get rid of it. The first thing I want to do here is actually take my original footage and break it apart into a sequence of images. I've covered this several times before uh, across many different tutorial series on this channel. So what I'm going to do here is change this main window type into a video sequence editor. That's Blender's video editing window. And I'll change the window layout uh, to have both a video frame and the sequence strips. I'm going to click on add down here and I'm going to add a movie um, and that's gonna be from my desktop and it is just this default named uh, movie file from my camera now it's important to know that this footage was shot on my Canon T3i camera um, not a cell phone and I find that when you're doing camera tracking having a better camera with a bigger sensor tends to work a little bit better I had some success tracking from cell phone footage but I get much better results um, not necessarily in terms of the video quality but just the tracking quality making sure that objects stay where they're supposed to when I use my larger camera. So I have this footage here. I can scrub through and take a look at it. I'm only going to use the first 250 frames. That's the default length of my timeline. I'm going to get rid of, I believe it's the dark blue strip. So I can right click on that and delete that. That's just the actually, no, pardon me. It's the light blue strip I want to get rid of. That's the audio. So now I'm only going to be working with the video in my scene. That's great. I want to match my input settings um, when I render this out to a sequence of JPEG images. Uh, when I take a video with my Canon T3i, uh, the resolution is the same one that's here, 1920 by 1080, but I'll turn it up 50% up to 100% to get the full size. I'm going to go down to output and output not to PNG images, but to JPEGs. Uh, that'll just take up less space on my computer, but I'm gonna change the quality to 95 and press enter. I'm gonna output to a folder on my desktop. So I'll go to my desktop and I'm going to uh, create a new folder right there. I'm gonna name this uh, kitchen uh, counter tracking. Sure, I'm gonna go into that folder and I'm just gonna leave the file name blank there because it'll auto number all of the images and I think we are good to go. I'll click on animation that will render out all of the frames. Uh, and by the way, it did when I imported the video, it did change my frame rate to match the frame rate of my video, which is just under 24 frames per second. That's important. Great, let's go ahead now. And I have those uh, images in a folder on my desktop. That's perfect. I'm gonna make a new Blender file. So file new and reload startup file. It's at this point that I wanna bring up a different window. It's the movie clip editor window, which is different than the video sequence editor. And it's in this window. You might've seen this before in some of my past videos when I did things like tracking and masking and removing wires. I'll put a link on the video right now to the rest of this tutorial series in creating visual movie effects in Blender. Uh, there's lots of stuff in there to create different types of visual effects. So in this window, I'm gonna bring in that sequence of images that we just created. So I'll go down to open 
and I'll go to my desktop and to that folder. And if I press A with a mouse in this window, A will select all. It'll also deselect all, but make sure you have them all selected. And then I'll click on open clip and that will bring in the image sequence into Blender. Now, if I scrub through, you're gonna notice uh, on my timeline that right above my timeline, I have this lighter purple area with darker purple behind it. And the lighter purple area is where Blender has actually loaded in those JPEG images into its memory. Now, I actually want to work uh, with all the images already loaded into Blender ahead of time so we don't have to wait for Blender to find those um, images on my computer. So I'm gonna go back to the beginning, back to frame one, not frame zero. And I'm gonna click up here on prefetch that will fetch all of the images into Blender's memory. So if I click that, hopefully it'll propagate out the images into that cache. If your images won't load uh, past a certain point, what you can do is go up to file, and user preferences. What's happening is that Blender does not have access to enough RAM memory in your computer, and you can actually change that under the System tab, and then under Sequencer Clip Editor Memory Cache Limit. By default, it is 1024. That's essentially one gig of your computer's RAM. Your computer probably has two, if not four gigs, probably even more if your computer is quite new, eight. I have 16 gigs, so I don't mind using 10,000, which is approximately 10 gigs of memory. You might want to set it to just 2,000 if you have four gigs of RAM, something like that. And I'll click on save user settings. So now Blender has more access to RAM on my computer. Now, uh, what we have to do here to track the movement of my camera is actually track the movement of points in my scene. To do that, I'm gonna create tracking markers and we're gonna track specific points of high contrast in my video. To create a tracking marker, I'm simply gonna hold control on my keyboard and left click on a point that I wanna track. And I have this scene set up with some tracking markers that are just magnets from my uh, fridge right behind my counter. And so what I'll do is I'll hold control and left click and that will put a square tracking marker. Now you can repeat this process, but actually I'm gonna delete that one because there's a few things I forgot. Before you add any tracking markers, you wanna look over here because here are the settings for your tracking markers that you're gonna create create ahead of time. Um, I usually, or always actually, check this normalize button. That'll make sure that if um, the video sort of uh, changes the exposure or things get lighter or darker ever, um, this will much better improve your results and it won't lose the tracking as it's going along. Um, I'm going to change uh, the tracking presets to, in this case, fast motion, because the camera moves a little bit fast in some places and things jump around. What that will mean is that uh, if I hold control and left click on a point where I wanna add a tracking marker um, and I show over here in the properties panel, the search um, area, that'll be a larger search area where, where it'll actually look for this smaller square within the bigger square as it's going through different frames of the movie. It won't search outside of that area. So having a smaller box would be good for slower moving uh, camera movements, but having a larger box is better for quicker camera movements. I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in and I can scale this box down. I can even distort it or I can tap S. Of course, I can deselect it with the A key. I can right click to select it. I'm gonna scale it down to about the size of that magnet. I can repeat this process now, but actually Blender has a feature where it'll auto detect good points or what it thinks are good points to track. So I'm actually gonna click on detect features up here and it will go through my scene and find points where it thinks tracking will work. Now, it's not always perfect and it doesn't always pick the best points. Uh, this point down here, because this cable uh, for my laptop um, is not really in a fixed point because where it is along that edge will change depending on the perspective of my camera. I don't want that one, so I'm gonna select it by right clicking and I'll click X and delete that track. Um, that one's okay, let's go ahead and see where the other ones are. I can press A to deselect and select things. Um, I'm not sponsored by Coke, I just thought this would be a good thing to track because you don't wanna just track things that are on a flat plane. You wanna have things that are above and below or preferably just not all on the same plane. It's not finding these magnets, which I think is funny, uh, so we'll have to add those. I don't like that one right there. Um, oops, I had them all selected there. I'll press A to D, select all. Select that one by right clicking and then I'll click on delete track. Um, I wanna track a few more things in my scene. I don't like that because it's two different parts 
um, it'll change depending on the angle of my camera. I'm going to track, so I'll hold control and left click um, that magnet and tap S to scale up. I'm going to track that one. I can press G. If you hold uh, shift after you press G, it'll move slower and more precisely. I'll scale it up a little bit to encompass the whole magnet. Control click, S. There we go. Control click, uh, S. Control click. And I'll scale that one down. That one's fine. I actually want to track a few magnets back here on my fridge, so I'm going to control click and then S. That'll track pretty well because it's an area of high contrast and a very recognizable shape. Um, I'm going to control click, uh, let's say right um, on the inside of that K there. Good. Okay, I think we're doing pretty good. I want to track something on this book. I'll tap S and put that right about there. Good. I'm gonna be right there because I want more things on this on this counter plane. So right about there, and click and G. Okay, so we have lots of points to track. What I'll do is I'll press A a few times to select all of my tracking markers, and now I want to actually track forward. I'm on frame one now. I can press this forward button. Actually, I'm gonna click just one frame forward, and it's going to actually put a little path between where each marker was in the last frame and where we are now in frame two. I can go a few more times so you can kind of see what's happening here. And now I'll just press uh, the track forward button and it's gonna go through and track all the way through the video. Hopefully none of the tracking markers get lost, but that often happens. Let's go ahead now and zoom out and let's see how they did if I kind of go through. Things are looking pretty good. Good. Some of these things uh, off to the side get cut off. You can see that one doesn't know what to do now. Let's see how it was at the beginning. It was following that little part on that key. So what you can actually do, even if something goes outside the uh, video and then it comes back in like it did there. I don't want to track things too near the edge, but what was it tracking? It was tracking that this the upper white part on that loop so I'm gonna go right there and I can press G now at this frame to grab that tracking marker making sure I don't have anything else selected and I'll put it right back where it was and then I can track a little bit further and now I can track forward and it should stay with it for the rest of the video which it did that's looking pretty good how do the rest of these things do I want to look at this one actually because I think it might have slid around a little bit it was positioned right kind of at the corner above the first block and then by the end it was kind of it kind of jumped down there can you see that yeah it didn't do a, do a very good job so what I can do here is I'm actually gonna go back to the beginning I'm gonna clear all of the tracking data for that tracking marker so I can click that button it'll erase everything I'm gonna manually place that one onto the middle square and I don't like how it's rotating the tracking I don't need that really um, so I'm just going to use track the location of that square. I'll scale that up a little bit so we can see all of this contrast. And I'll track forward now. I'll just track a few frames at the beginning. And I'll track all the way through. Ooh, it got very lost. That is not good. So it was doing well up until right about there. So I'll track or I'll clear everything after that point. I'll track manually. Oh, it jumped down. I'll put it back up in the middle. So you can set manual keyframes and hopefully you don't have to do that too much because of course it'll take longer. Mm, nope, it did not do very well. So I'm gonna speed this part of the video up now. I'm gonna correct this tracking marker. I might have to clear some and then redo it and position a few keyframes along the uh, timeline until we're done. All right, so I've gone through and I've corrected the tracking of that little Rubik's Cube. Let's go ahead and press A now to select all the tracking markers. And if I scrub through, they all look pretty good. There was actually a tracking marker down there by that shadow that it 
added, but I got rid of it. Uh, by the way, if you're using footage that you shot that has a lot of detail or a lot of high contrast uh, areas in the video, Blender might actually find a lot of tracking markers, and that's okay because there is a quick way to clean them up, and that's the next process um, of tracking, is we need to actually have Blender calculate the scene, look at all the movement of the markers, and try to figure out where they are in a 3D environment. There's a few things we have to do, though, before we can do that, and by the way, this process after that is cleaning up that data to get a better solution of where the tracking markers are. Before we can get there though, we have to actually set a few parameters up in our scene. It matters what camera you use to shoot your video, not just having a good camera, but actually the sensor size. I shot this video again with my Canon T3i camera, and over here in the properties panel, there is a section to define what camera you're using, or more specifically, what the sensor size on your camera is. You can Google search that information, the size of the sensor in your model of camera. Um, I happen to know that my camera has a sensor size of Canon's APS-C. Uh, that means it's a smaller sensor than 35 millimeters. Um, I actually shot that other video on the street using my Google Nexus 6P camera, and that has one that has one or one to what 2.3 inches, so it's smaller than 2.3 inches by a matter of 10 times. Uh, so I would use that one for my cell phone, but I'll use this for my uh, bigger SLR camera. And great, that changed these values down here. I'm gonna click on center, and that will define the center of my video. In fact, I'm gonna change the resolution up over here under the camera tab to 100 just in case. So we have to pick our camera sensor and know how big it is. The other thing we have to do over here in the solve section, the solve tab of our tool shelf, is we have to have Blender refine and have it figure out what camera lens is on the camera. If you have a zoom lens or if you have a wide angle lens, that will affect how the 3D is or the 3D um, perspective is in your video. So actually I'm gonna have Blender refine not only the focal length, that's the zoom of your camera lens, but also this K1 and K2 data, as well as the optical center of the video. This K1 and K2 uh, defines the distortion of your video, kind of like the distortion in a fish eye lens, um, especially the edges of your video are not perfectly representing how things look. You might notice in some videos or photos that the edges of the video look blurred or stretched or distorted. That's the case with all camera lenses, so Blender's gonna figure that out for us. We're gonna have it figure out most of the stuff uh, instead of having to input it manually. Okay, now we're gonna have Blender try to solve um, this tracking by looking at all the movement data. So I'm gonna press A again to select um, all the markers in my scene. I'm gonna save this file before I click on solve camera motion. So I'll go to file and save, and I'll go to my desktop, and I'm gonna call this tracking-001, and I'll click save Blender file. Great, let's go ahead and click solve camera motion and it actually did that quite quickly because we don't have that many tracking markers. By the way, you have to have at least eight tracking markers that run all the way through your video. Uh, in this case, we have many more than that in order to do a solve, but it won't let you do it if you have fewer than eight. And it gave me, and this is the number that's really crucial, a solve error of 3.1469. That is okay but it's not very great. In fact, I'm not gonna be happy with that. You wanna aim for a solve error that's less than one. And so three is quite a bit higher. If you have something like 10 or 20, that is not acceptable. You will not get a very good track. It will not look like the things are staying where they should be in the video, even at 3.14. Uh, it's not very good. So how do we clean that up? Well, I'm actually gonna divide this window into two. I'm gonna grab this little triangle area and left click and drag it straight down to divide the window into two. I'm gonna change this lower window type. Um, it's gonna stay a movie clip editor window, but we wanna look at the graph of the movement of our tracking markers. I'm gonna make sure all my markers are selected. And as you can see a lot of them are moving together in the beginning that's a good sign but then we have some outliers we have these ones that kind of don't do what the rest of the markers are doing um, and you're gonna have some variation that's okay but I think that one isn't very good so I want to look at that one um, of course I can retrack and then resolve if I want to let's look at that one as it goes through and that especially gets into the later part of the videos right about there 
Um, it's kind of wandering around. Maybe if I look at this area, this preview, it starts in the middle and it slides around a bit. And then by the end of the video, it's no longer in the middle of that magnet. So that one isn't a very good one. I'm going to see what this one is. In fact, that one has a pretty bad spike in it. Um, that's that one right there, and that's not a good tracking marker anyways. So I'm just going to select the outliers and delete them. So I'll press X after I right click to select that curve. Then I'll get rid of that tracking marker. Same thing with this one and this one. That's why it's good to have many more tracking markers than you need at the start of your tracking. Um, that one I don't like, so I'll press X. If you have a lot of tracking markers, this process might take a while. Um, it actually got rid of that magnet. Uh, that's okay, or that tracking marker on the magnet. Um, and that's okay as well as uh, that one, I think. Uh, what is... Oh, that one's part of the shadow. Uh, that one's okay. We'll see how it goes. We can also have Blender go through and clean up our tracking mark markers, or at least select the ones that are bad um, for me. If I select all of my tracking markers and then go up to the... Um, under Solve, it'll be under the Cleanup section, and I can define how I want to filter these tracking markers. Um, I can filter markers that have fewer than a specified number of frames. So I'm going to change this to maybe uh, 20 frames, and then be able to set an error of, I don't want any tracking markers left that have an error of um, greater than maybe two. So if I click on this Clean Tracks, what it's going to do is select those tracking markers and yeah it's selected most of them so most of them have a tra tracking error of more than two what if i change this up to like eight clean tracks actually just got rid of that one i'm not sure why they still say it's selected um so i'm actually going to get rid of that one yep um, these numbers don't necessarily represent um, the actual error of any one of the points. I don't tend to use this very much. I tend to just go ahead and delete outliers down here in my graph. Let's go ahead now and select all the markers and solve camera motion again and see what we get. In this case, we got 1.2985. Can I get rid of any of the other kind of bad markers? Maybe that one right there. Let's get rid of that one. We also might try setting a different range of keyframes for which it'll look at, uh, or in between. So in this case, it's going from frame one to frame 30, and it's using only those frames to figure out what our solve error is and where everything should be in the scene. But if I select all my tracking markers and change this to a different number, or change the two numbers, in this case, I'm gonna go from one to 100, and I solve camera motion, I might get a better solve error, and yes, I do. I got 1.09, I'm happy with that. Let's go ahead and set up our scene. To do that, I'm gonna divide this upper window. In fact, I'll make this lower one narrower. I'm going to divide this window into two. So I'll grab this little triangle area, left click and drag it to make two windows where there was one. I'm going to change this right window into a 3D view window to see my scene, which I haven't edited at all yet. In fact, while I'm here, I'm going to change my render engine to cycles. That will become very, very important later. We don't want to use the old render engine to make photo real compositing of 3D elements into a uh, into a real life video, so cycles please. Okay, so if I look through my camera, even though I've done all my tracking and I've got a pretty good solve error, nothing is there. And that's because we have to set up the compositing of the scene. Luckily, uh, Blender does most of the work for us. At the bottom of my tool shelf over here um, in the movie clip editor window, I can set up my whole scene using just two buttons. So I'm going to click on set up tracking scene first. And what that will do is it will actually add my background as well, but it will change the movement of my camera and add in empties where all of my markers are in my 3D space. If I scrub through my timeline, you can see my camera is moving. If I break out of the camera, you can actually see that it's moving around. It's added a ground plane. It's added, well, it's kept the cube there um, and it's doing pretty good. I'll also want to click on set as background. In fact, it already had that background, so I'm not sure if that's still necessary, but I always do it. Now, if I scrub through my timeline, things are looking okay over here. I'll make these side panels go away for a moment. Um, things are looking okay, but this plane doesn't seem like it's following the surface of my uh, counter, and that's what I want. I actually, before I do any of this, I actually want to use that lens distortion, that K1 and that K2 um, under solve and 
those and pieces of information, I want to use that to undistort my video. Yes, Blender can actually take the video and undistort it. That means unwarp it in the circular pattern of your lens. And how you do that is you simply click over here. This is the, the side properties panel of this window. Um, you can just check uh, render undistorted. And then over here on the properties panel of your 3D viewport, you can go down to the background images section and render undistorted is checked, but I'll change the opacity up to one so we can see it as it's supposed to be. So that's great. It's gonna render the video undistorted. You might have seen a little bit of change there. It kind of makes the video uh, smaller, but it won't be bent at the edges. Now, why is it not looking like it's on the surface of the counter? That's because um, that ground plane is well below the surface of the counter. This is not the, in the right position and it's not the right scale. So what I'm gonna do is back over in this window, I'm gonna select markers that will define the floor or zero on the Z axis um, in my 3D scene. So I'm gonna select that marker. In fact, I'll press A a few times to deselect everything. I'm gonna select that marker by right clicking. I'm gonna select that marker and that marker and that marker. And now I'm gonna go under my Solve tab and click on Floor. In fact, it only wants three, so I'm gonna select that one and that one and that one and click on Floor. And then as you can see over here, my camera actually jumped as did the empties. So if I press zero now, that cube much more realistically looks like it's sitting um, on the ground or at least, actually it's too big right now, so we'll keep going, but it still move, moves with the scene. Um, we want to define the scale now as well as the orientation of our 3D scene as opposed to the camera. So I want my origin to be kind of in the middle of the counter. That's 0, 0, 0 in my 3D world. What I can do here is I can, with these uh, three markers selected, because the middle of them would be right about there, I can click on Set Origin, and that will put right in the middle of those three markers. Um, that'll move everything so it's in the middle right there in my 3D scene. Great. So the next step is to rotate your 3D world in the right direction. Now, if my origin is somewhere in the middle of my counter right about there, I can either define a marker that would define the uh, X axis or the Y axis in my scene. And the one that I see that's closest is that one. It's a little bit up. It's not quite on the surface, but it's sort of in that direction. And I'm going to use that as the Y direction in my scene. So I'm going to select that one and click on set Y axis and things rotate a little bit. And the next thing I wanna do is to find my scale. So I'm gonna select two markers and right here I'm gonna define the distance. In this case, I'm gonna make that distance 10 because each one of these squares is one. So that sort of makes sense for me in the scope of this scene. Um, and I'll click on set scale and that will zoom things out. Let's go and see now what my scene looks like. If I scrub through, it looks like the plane is on the ground. That's what I want, um, but it's not quite rotated in the right way. I didn't define that marker or didn't, that marker isn't quite what I wanted to use. What I can do, now as I can select my camera, I can right click on the edge of it over here and I can tap R and then Z on my keyboard and I can rotate my camera around right about there. I can also uh, right click on that edge and press G to move it around so it kind of looks like it's on the uh, ground right about there. And so how does this look if I kind of scrub through? It looks pretty good. What I might want to do at this point is select those three markers again for the floor, and I might define those again under solve as the floor. No, that just rotated the scene. Can I uh, rotate my camera on the Z axis? Yes, I can. And then I'll press G and then X and then I'll press G and then Y to move my camera uh, side to side, just like that, and then G and then Y. I'm moving the camera around now. Oops, I meant G and then X to move it back on the X axis. I'm moving the camera and nothing else in the scene. That looks pretty good to me. Um, I might play around to rotate my camera a little bit more like that on the Z axis and then G and then um, y like 
that that's looking pretty good to me so now if i scrub through it looks like this plane is sitting like a piece of paper on my counter i can tap s to scale it up to match the edges approximately of my counter and hopefully those edges kind of stay with the edges of my counter i can go into edit mode now in fact i'm going to make this window quite a bit bigger i'll just drag the edge of it over um, make sure that you have lock camera to view on this properties panel uh, not checked. You never want to move the camera now. Uh, so now if you try to orbit, it'll just break out of the camera. Um, hopefully you know what that checkbox button does. I'm going to move my cube up to be on the ground. And so now we have a scene that matches the tracking of the movement of the camera. But now we want to work with compositing because this plane shouldn't really be there. We want to add objects onto the counter. But actually what this plane is, is not a plane that will show up in your video. It's a shadow only plane. I actually made a tutorial on this on how to create a shadow only plane from scratch. I'll put a link to that on the screen right now. But Blender has done it for us using that setup scene button that we clicked earlier. So if I actually go ahead and render this scene out, I can go to my camera tab and click on render. Hopefully what you just saw there, even though it was sped up, was the fact that it rendered out two passes. It rendered out only the cube, and then it rendered out only the plane, and then it came up with this render. It put three layers together. It put the cube layer, the ground plane shadows only layer, and then the video layer all together. And we'll look at those uh, compositing nodes in just a moment. What I want to do now is adjust my lighting. So I'm going to select the lamp in my scene. This is a point lamp by default. I don't like that. So I'm going to select it, go to my lamp tab, and then I'll change my lamp to, I could either use a sun or an area lamp. I'm going to use an area lamp. I'm going to click on use nodes. I'm going to change the strength of my lamp to a thousand. And it's an area lamp, which means it can have like a square or rectangular surface. I'm going to change it to a square right there. And I'll change the size to about seven. Sure. If I break out of my camera now with the zero key, I can position my, my uh, lamp. So I'll press Alt-R to clear its rotation. I'll go to my side uh, orthographic view uh, where the window is in my scene is actually behind me. Uh, so I want to put the lamp uh, in my scene to kind of match that. So I'm going to go back into my side view and I'll tap R to rotate it like it's that uh, big window over there. And I'll put it right about there. So if I look through my scene, actually, no R, Z, uh, 90. Let's go from my top so I can kind of see what's happening. Uh, I'll rotate it 180 degrees to be in the right direction. I kind of just got turned around there. So that looks pretty good to me. Let's go ahead and go back through my camera. And if I do a new render, the lighting should be better. Before I do that though, I'm going to go into edit mode with tab key on my keyboard in the plane. And I'm going to stretch the edges of this plane to kind of match the edges of my countertop so that so the shadows will be sort of um, more natural and they won't go off where they're not supposed to be. I'll press tab to go back into object mode and let's go ahead and do a quick render. Okay, that's looking quite a bit more realistic. Um, the shadows are okay. We'll adjust those in just a moment. What I'll do now is I'll press escape. I'm gonna add some different objects into my scene. So I'm gonna select my cube. I'm gonna press X to get rid of it. I'm gonna press, actually my 3D cursor is way down there. So I'm gonna select my uh, plane and I'll press shift S. That'll bring up my snap menu. In fact, I'm gonna turn on screencast keys late in this video so you can see what I'm pressing and uh, clicking right down there. I wanna bring my, my 3D cursor up to my plane so I can add new objects and they'll be about in the right spot. So I'll press shift S, that'll bring up my snapping menu and I'll say uh, cursor to selected. Now my 3D cursor is in the right spot so I can add new objects and they'll be there. I'm gonna add a monkey head. Uh, I'll go to my side view. I'm gonna scale that up. Yeah, it's a nice big. Uh, monkey head and I'll go to my side view and rotate it and move it up so it's sitting nicely on the ground. I want to make it smooth. I want to add subsurf to it and I want to add a just a plain old diffuse material to it just for now. Uh, let's go ahead and move it just a little bit more down and fix that rotation so it's actually sitting on the ground. That looks pretty good to me. I'm going to rotate it on the z-axis so I'll tap R and then Z on my keyboard. I'll put it right about there. I'll press G and then shift Z so I can move it on the X and Y axes only. I'll put it back there. I'm going to add one or two more things. I'm going to add a cone. I'll scale it up. 
I'll make sure that it is about the right size and sitting on the ground. And I'll press G and Shift Z and I'll put it right about there. One more object, I'm gonna add a torus and I can change the properties of my torus down here before I move it. I'm gonna change the minor radius to make it a bit bigger and the minor segments to make it smoother. And I'm gonna move it up. So I'll go to my side view or in this case, my front view actually. I'll put it right about there. Go back through my camera, G and then shift Z to move it, but not on the Z axis. That looks pretty good to me. I'm going to add materials, the same one to the a donut, and which is material.001. I'm just gonna call this white. And then that one, I'll just add white to it. Great. Our scene is set up. Let's go ahead and click on render under the camera tab and see what we have. Aha, so we have a problem. Our objects that we've added are part of the ground plane layer. What Blender actually did, I'll press escape so we can see what's happening here. There are two layers down here in our scene. Anything on this bottom layer, this specific one right there, will show up as a shadow only object. I added by accident those three objects to that layer. So I'm gonna select my three objects. I'll press M to bring up the move to layer pop-up right there and I'll click on this layer. I believe any other layer you use will be just a normally shaded object. So now I have my camera and my lamp and the three objects in that layer. I want to make sure they're both selected with, with the shift key. So now if I click on render, as you can see, I have a fairly decent looking render. I don't think my lamp is bright enough, so I'll press escape. I'll press zero to break out of my camera. I'm gonna select my lamp and make it a bit brighter. Maybe I'll go for 2000. But what I wanna do now is actually make a node editor window to fix my compositing and make the shadows and the colors look better. I'm gonna go back through my camera. I'm gonna do one more render and then we'll just do some compositing work and some color work. So render. Okay, so this is our scene. Um, the edge of my ground plane doesn't quite perfectly match um, the edge of the counter, but I'm not too worried about that. What I wanna fix now is the shadows and the coloring of my scene. Of course, if I had gone to my lamp tab with my lamp selected, I could have given my lamp some color. I could have made it um, the color of the light in the scene, which is sort of a yellowy, I think, even though well, the light's coming in, but it's blue, but there's yellow paint on the walls, or it's a little bit yellowy and a little bit magenta-y in this picture. Um, I could adjust that with my lamp and then re-render, but I'm just gonna use compositing notes to change the colors in the scene. So I'm actually gonna use that window that I had before. This is the movie clip editor window, but I'm gonna change it into a node editor window. Uh, right now I can see the material on one of my objects. This is the material that happens to be on that lamp object. I'm gonna switch over to compositing nodes. And as you can see, um, when we clicked on setup scene, when we were just finishing tracking, um, this is what Blender created. If I zoom in, and I'm assuming that you know and are comfortable using nodes um, for this tutorial, um, it has a movie clip node, which brings out in the video. It has a render layer of the ground plane and then the render layer of the objects uh, in the scene. It's done some um, undistorting and scaling. It's done inverting of masks and it's done some multiplying and added the videos together. Um, it's added a little bit of blur onto the video, so uh, when the camera moves around and the video is blurring, the objects will as well. What I want to do here is actually add some color correction to the objects in my scene. I'm going to add that right here before it does any blur. Actually, it doesn't really matter. I'll just do it uh, over here after it gets blurred. So I'm going to press Shift A on my keyboard. I'm going to add a color uh, node. It's going to be uh, color balance, I believe. Yep, that's the one. I'm going to drag that node into that noodle. So before it joins up, with the background and the plane, we'll, we'll add some color to it. I'm gonna add a little bit, and I'm not gonna go through this very much, but I'm gonna add a little bit of yellow to the scene. If I go way too far, things will get too yellow. That affects the shadows mostly. I'm only gonna make subtle changes here.
So that looks okay, maybe it's a little bit bright, so I might go back and adjust the brightness of my lamp in my 3D scene, or I could press Shift A, I could add a color, a RGB curves right there, a note and add it right there. So now I can kind of play with the brightness in my scene, and yes, it has to process it each time, but now it's a little bit dark, maybe a little bit too dark. That looks okay. Um, I want to work on the shadows now, and we can make the shadows smaller or more transparent or more dark by using the same RGB curves node. So I'm going to find that render layer there and follow it out. Before we add it to the backdrop, I'm going to add that same color RGB curves node right there. I can play with the shadows in my scene. If I drag it down, it'll make them darker. If I make them uh, drag this up, it'll make it brighter. If I pull this in, uh, it'll make the shadows darker, as you can see. So you can really play around with this to your heart's content. I don't think I would use the top point though, because if you move that at all, I think it will affect the entire scene, uh, except for the objects, which is not what you want necessarily. Maybe it is. So I'm going to leave that exactly where it was and only play with um, the bottom section. In fact, I can play with anywhere except for that point. Yeah, I don't like that. So I can make the shadows a little bit smaller. Yeah, that looks okay to me. Okay, so for now I'm happy with that result. The very last thing I'll do here is I'm going to um, adjust the color of the whole scene. And the way we do that is I'm going to pull these two last nodes outwards because this is the composite which actually um, affects the render. This is how we can render out the scene um, when it's all composited together here. And this is just my viewer, which I can actually use to show a backdrop uh, in this window if I want. But I want to make a splitter right there. So I'll hold shift down on my keyboard and left click and drag with the shift key held down uh, through that noodle. So now it'll put a little divider, little node in there, and I can connect that little node to this one. And so now I, right here, I can add any color correction I want to the entire composite. So I'll press Shift A on my keyboard, I'll add color, um, I'm gonna add um, color balance, and I'll put it right there, and now I can affect my entire scene um, and add kind of a uh, hue to it. If you want to go ahead and check out my tutorial on digital color grading for a video on Blender, I'll put a link to that on the screen right now. But I'm just going to play around with this very quickly and get a result that I'm happy with. And I'm going to add an RGB curves note to make my scene a little bit brighter or darker. So color, um, RGB curves. I'll put it up there and then I'll put it over there. Let's make the scene a whole lot brighter. Maybe not so much. Okay, so I have a result that I'm happy with. If I scope to a different part on my timeline, yes, it'll update here so we can see how the lighting will look in a different frame. But of course, in order to put the objects where they should be, we actually have to go back and re-render the scene out. So I'll do that very quickly. There we are. So it's at this point that if I'm happy with my result and I've checked a few frames, I could go ahead and render this out to a video file. I actually, during this video, I changed my compute device to use my video card to render out my scene so it goes faster. One thing I would do though when you're compositing 3D objects into a scene is under your camera tab, down here under sampling, I would check this little, or click this little clock button. What that little button does is when you're rendering with Blender Cycles, especially if you have lower samples, in this case, I'm only rendering out with 30, which is very low, you're gonna get grain in your video. If you do not check, this little uh, clock button, that greeniness will be static. It will not be moving. And that means your CG objects will have this constant grain on it. If you check this little clock button, the grain will be animated just like it would be in a video. And so your objects will look more natural in a video that already has its own grain because of your camera sensor. So this will improve the look of your entire composite. Of course, you can change under output your file format type. In this case, I'm gonna change it to H.264. That's a video codec. I'm gonna change my encoding from AVI to MPEG-4. That's the two most common codec and wrapper for videos today. And I can change my output location and then I could click on animation and I would get my finished video with the 
complete effects. But that will be it for this video. Please don't forget to click on that like button if you learned something in this video and click on subscribe to see more videos just like this one from my channel. Go ahead and check out my Facebook page at facebook.com slash But that'll be it for this one. Thanks. Bye-bye.